Welcome back to Bargaining and War. This lecture is on War's Inefficiency Puzzle. We're going to review what we've learned in this unit, and then outline the remainder of this course. In sum, this unit has been geared toward getting a single point across. Namely, that there always exist settlements that both sides prefer to war. This leaves a critical unanswered question out there. Think about the model's theoretical prediction compared to what we observe empirically. The model always predicts peace. The parties should always be landing on one of those agreements that both of them prefer to war. Now, to be fair to that theoretical prediction, that is what we observe the vast majority of time. I know wars get a lot of media attention, but the fact of the matter is, most countries, most of the time, are not fighting most other countries. Even the United States, a country that fights more wars than anyone else, is still at peace with the vast majority of countries in any given year. Nevertheless, wars are very costly and they're expensive, and so we should try to understand why they are fought. We can't currently do that with our baseline model. It's always predicting peace. It can't predict war. So the rest of this course is geared toward answering that question. Why is it that states fight despite the existence of mutually preferable settlements? That is, in short, war's inefficiency puzzle. Our recipe for war going forward has two ingredients. The first is straightforward. It's having a dispute. If two states agree on everything, there's no reason why they would ever be fighting if fighting is going to destroy things. This isn't really an interesting thing to be focusing on, though. This is what we hear in the news media, in history books, in basic one-on-one -on -one conversations with your average person. That's what we focus on, by and large. The narrative of the dispute. Think, for example, about the American Revolution. The classic explanation for that is that the U.S. colonists were tired of taxation without representation, and so they fought a war. The dispute is representation. What's not answered in that sort of thing, though, is why you don't get a settlement. In principle, there should always exist settlements that both parties prefer to fighting. So why is it that the colonists fought rather than settle? And that's the second ingredient in our recipe. A bargaining problem. The bargaining problem explains why, conditional on a dispute, we couldn't land on one of those agreements. This is what we are going to be focusing on for the rest of this course, and it's what political scientists have been spending most of their attention on lately. And that makes sense. Again, the narrative is always focused on the dispute. There's always going to be some sort of distinct part of a dispute if you look at one war versus another war versus another war versus another war. But what we've established in this literature on crisis bargaining is that we can summarize bargaining problems into basically just two classes. Class A, commitment problems. And class B, information problems. We're going to divide the remainder of this course into two parts. The first is going to focus on commitment problems. In these cases, the countries know the settlements that are mutually preferable to fighting. The problem is that they can't credibly commit to them in the long term, and so they end up in war anyway. Information problems are slightly different. In information problems, there's no sort of issue with committing to an agreement. The problem, however, is that we don't necessarily know which agreements are going to work for both of us. Throughout the model, we've assumed that everyone knows the distribution of power and how costly war is. In practice, one side might not know how many tanks its opponent has, and it might then not know where that bargaining range lies, and if it doesn't know where the bargaining range lies, then maybe we can't get peace. Again, with bargaining problems, if we've narrowed it down to just essentially two classes, then thinking about this in terms of trying to solve war more generally, and I know that's a 
big task for just a single online course. But if we were to try to do that, if we could figure out how to resolve commitment problems generally and resolve information problems generally, then even if countries have disputes with one another, we should be able to have some sort of conflict resolution system that avoids war. And so that's why we're focused on just those components, those commitment problems and those information problems, and trying to explain why they work, how they work, and how to resolve them. And that's, again, what we're going to be getting at in the remainder of this course, starting with the commitment problems. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.